later about some of that stuff. <laughs> So good to be among you this evening, brethren, as we open the scriptures together. And tonight I'm going to be speaking on worthy, standing, and suffering. And that brings us to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. And here the Apostle Paul writes these words. Only let your conversation or manner of life, is the sense, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I might hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his name's sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me, and now here to be in me. Thus far the reading of God's most precious word. Years ago, Portuguese settlers built a massive cathedral on the southern coast of the South China Sea. On the top of that cathedral, they placed a large cross that could literally be seen for miles around. In the course of time, a typhoon proved to be stronger than the works of man's hands, and the cathedral was completely destroyed. All that remained was part of the front of the building and the cross that stood high above. It was some years after that that there was a shipwreck in that area, and the famous poet and hymn writer Sir John Bowring was aboard and he recounted years later in his journey journal how he had drifted on a piece of the wreckage for day after day after day and when all strength and all hope seemed to be lost one morning as dawn broke across the horizon and the mist was rising from the water he looked into the distance and he saw that cross. And he began to think about all that the Lord Jesus Christ had accomplished for him at Calvary. How he was justified freely by his grace. How he had the hope of eternal life. Eventually, the waves brought him to the seashore and he made his way up the steep hill and he sat down at the foot of that cross and he penned the words of the famous hymn, In the cross of Christ I glory. In the cross of Christ I glory, powering over the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. That's beautiful, isn't it, brother? The cross of Christ transforms lives. It is the good news that the Apostle Paul speaks of here in his letter to the Philippians. Now, as Paul was preparing to pen the words of the passages that are before us this evening, I'm sure there was a flood of memories that swept over him. How when he first came into Europe, that he came to the city of Philippi. And it was there that he established the church at Philippi. The Apostle Paul was a church planter, and we would do right well to follow him in that example. Amen. Initially, it was a very small group of believers. 
They didn't have a facility such as we have here this evening. In fact, they only met right along the sea or the, the riverside as Paul ministered the gospel of the grace of God to them. Now, brethren, I want to pause to say this. We must not despise the day of small things. It is human nature to want to be a part of something big, something that is dramatic, dynamic. However, if you stop and think about it for a moment, God has done His greatest work through the remnants, through the little flocks, through the church, in the house, in the days of Noah, only eight souls brought the word of God into the new world. During the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, multitudes sat at the Master's feet as he ministered the gospel of the kingdom to them. Literally thousands, undoubtedly tens of thousands were saved. But do you realize after his crucifixion, only 120 were in the upper room. They were the caretakers of the truth. God was going to channel his blessing through that little flock to preserve his word and the message of the kingdom and to share it to the leaders in Israel. And then the Apostle Paul's ministry. Most of the local churches he ministered to were churches in the house to a small band of believers as he opened the Word of God unto them. Now with that in mind, while the denominations might look upon us in the grace movement as being insignificant, we are not insignificant in the eyes of God. It is an honor, and we boast not in this, it is an honor before God to have an understanding of the word rightly divided. Amen. To be the preservers of the heavenly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to count that a blessing from God. But with that blessing comes the responsibility to make known Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Right. Now here in verse 27, the Apostle Paul was sure that because of the prayers of the saints at Philippi, that he would soon be released from his incarceration. But he wasn't sure about that. And so with that context in mind, Paul says, only let your conversation or your manner of life. And we want to pause there on that term, conversation or manner of life. Behind it is a family of Greek words. And the main word is citizenship. But interestingly here, Paul uses the verb form of that word. Now, the saints at Philippi were very familiar with citizenship because, you see, years earlier in 42 B.C., Caesar Augustus and Mark Anthony fought two decisive battles right outside of the city of Philippi against Cassius and Brutus. Caesar Augustus was determined to avenge the death of Julius Caesar. And he was victorious in both of those battles. And as a tribute, rather than make those who were his captors slaves, he bestowed citizenship upon them. And so now we have the posterity of those at Philippi, many of these saints that Paul brought to a saving knowledge of Christ possessed Roman citizenship. And so he knew that they understood that there were certain rights and privileges that came with that citizenship. 
They had immunity from arrest. They could not be beaten uncondemned. They could appeal even unto the highest power, Caesar himself, if they were unjustly accused of something. Paul himself did that. But also with citizenship comes responsibility. And here, that is what we see in this passage. Because when Paul says, let your conversation or manner of life be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, as I mentioned a moment ago, he uses the verb form of the word. And verbs, of course, are action words. And so the Apostle Paul recognizes their heavenly citizenship, but now he wants them to put that in action. He wanted them to walk worthy of their heavenly citizenship to the honor and glory of God. And that's why he says, let your manner of life be in keeping or consistent with the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I might hear of your affairs. Now the apostle wasn't sure if he would ever see the faces of these dear saints ever again. But he says, whether I'm absent or whether I'm able to come and spend time with you, he wanted to know all about them. Paul and these dear saints have a very, very special relationship. And the saints at Philippi had the highest esteem for the Apostle Paul. But Paul had very wisely, after he brought them to a saving knowledge of Christ, he had grounded them in the Word. And anyone who is a pastor or a spiritual leader, the goal of the ministry is not to promote oneself. Rather, it is to teach the brethren the Word of God, that their spiritual roots might go very deeply into the fertile soil of God's Word, that they might bear fruit to the honor and to the glory of God. Paul did not want them to place their faith in him. Rather, he wanted them to place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He wanted their eyes to be upon Him, that they were serving Him to God's honor and to His glory. Now, today, we see that it is said many times, and we've all seen it, whenever a pastor will leave a local assembly, he feels led of the Lord that his tenure is up there and he moves on only to learn that after his departure, many who sat under his ministry and in his former ministry scattered to the wind. And that ought not to be. It beckons the question, were they following the message of the Word of God or were they merely following a man? You see, as we gather in this assembly this evening, as you gather at your local assembly, our desire is that you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Word of God. Right. And specifically, rightly divided. Because what it will do is bring stability into your Christian life. That you might walk worthy of your calling. And you know, everything can collapse around you. And if you have your eyes upon Christ and you're grounded in the Scriptures, you can continue in the faith. It is dangerous to place your faith in a man, no matter how godly he may be. Because if he fails and he falls, the likelihood of you being so shaken in the faith that you too may fall with him.
but not if you keep your eyes on Christ. Amen. Then as we move on here in verse 27, notice the apostle says that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. This is the first hint that there was a problem at Philippi. Apparently, some were questioning one or two of the planks of the sevenfold unity of the Holy Spirit. And Paul was concerned about that. He had received word from Epaphroditus, and his heart was heavy because he knew that this had the potential of going into a division, to develop into a division. And once that happens, most times when there's a division in a local church, it never fully ever recovers again for the gospel of Christ. And Paul knew that. And therefore, he here sees that while there was a union among the saints at Philippi, you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. And so here the Apostle Paul is going to challenge them that they might again have that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now what's the difference between union and unity? Well, if you take two pieces of plastic, clear plastic, about a half inch thick, and you put them both together and you put four screws in them, you have a union of the two pieces. You can take the four screws out and you can separate or divide them. And that was the state of the church at Philippi. And you can see why Paul was so concerned. Because he didn't want to see a division in that assembly. If we take these two pieces of plastic, same two pieces, and we grind them up, and we place them into the hopper of an injection molding machine, which melts plastic, and it produces products, we heat the barrel of that machine up to about 500 degrees. We inject that plastic into a small mold. After it cools, we open it up, and we have one piece. Now, suddenly, there is unity. The two have become one, and we might use it for a paperweight. And that's what Paul desired here for these saints at Philippi. He wanted there to be a unity among them. But how is that established? Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4 for a moment. Ephesians chapter 4, and let's drop down to verse 3. Paul says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now what I want you to note in that passage is this. The Apostle Paul did not establish that unity. No one at Philippi established this unity. Rather, you will note, it is the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, and we are to endeavor to keep it. So if you want to be in the center of God's will, you must keep this sevenfold unity of the Spirit. It is that which unites us. This is the basis for our fellowship together in Christ. In verse 4, and we'll just touch on these very briefly, there is one body. Paul is talking about the church, the body of Christ, made up of Jews and Gentiles without distinction. We are not Israel. We shall never be Israel. Amen. We are not spiritual Israel. We are members of the church, the body of Christ. And one spirit. 
Now, as we know, we serve one true and living God who is in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are co-equal and co-eternal. The Holy Spirit is God. But that is not what Paul is desirous for us to see in this passage. He believed in the deity of the Spirit, and so do we. Rather, Paul is speaking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It differs from time past, when the Spirit of God would come upon the prophets, the priests, and the kings. At Pentecost, he indwelt the believers at Pentecost. He completely took control of them, and they performed signs and miracles and wonders. What Paul is saying here in the sevenfold unity is the Spirit of God is working in a completely different manner today. Today, the moment you trust Christ as your personal Savior, you are indwelt by the Spirit of God. And the Scriptures instruct us in Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit. It's a goal to attain. You can't have more of the Spirit, but the Spirit wants more of you as you yield to Him Amen. and to the Word of God. Amen. So His ministry is different today. And you only learn that in Paul's revelation. Even as you are called in one hope of your calling, if there is one thing clear, when Paul received his revelation from the Lord of glory, is that the church, the body of Christ, has a heavenly hope and calling. Someday soon, brethren, the trump is going to sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to forever be with the Lord, and we are going to be seated with Christ in the heavenlies, and rule and reign with Him there for all eternity. That's our hope in Christ. Praise God. We have a heavenly hope and calling. And there is one Lord. Again, the Apostle Paul confirms the deity of Christ, and so do we. But here again, he was talking about the ministry of our Lord today. The Lord is no longer carrying out His earthly ministry to the chosen nation. We do not know Him as the lowly Jesus who went about Palestine healing the sick and raising the dead. Rather, we know Christ in a completely different light. We know Him as the Lord of glory. We know Him as the Savior of the world, as the head of the church, the body of Christ. Today, He is carrying out His heavenly ministry for the church. Therefore, we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We see God today in the person of Christ is lavishing the world with the riches of His grace. Then we move on to the one faith. Now some have taught that Paul's talking about the faith, his whole revelation. And that is something that you should entertain. However, I see the faith all around us in the other unities of the Spirit. Rather, I think Paul here is talking about something that is uniquely found in his epistles. And that is the faith of Christ when he faithfully went to Calvary on our behalf to redeem us back to God. And then our faith in Christ when we believe the gospel. And so the terms of the gospel today is that Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again. <coughs> Now, that's to be distinguished from the terms of salvation under the kingdom gospel. Back in those days, it was repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and then they would be saved. That's foreign to Paul's epistles. We learn that we are saved by grace through faith, alone, apart from works. And we're saved by believing the gospel of salvation which is based on the faithfulness of Christ as we place our faith in Him, that God loves us and Christ died for our sins. And then we have the one baptism. Here Paul is speaking about our spiritual baptism into Christ. 
Even as a former Baptist in our local assembly anyway back in those days, we believed this was the baptism that saved. We believed this to be a spiritual baptism. But of course, many do not believe that in the denominations. But here, Paul is clearly talking about our one baptism into the Lord, whereby we are identified with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. His death was our death. His burial was our burial. His resurrection brought us into newness of life. This is the baptism that saves. And in verse 6, there is one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Again, God the Father is God. But here Paul is touching on the eternal plans and purposes of God for the church. The apostle calls it the manifold wisdom of God. The things that angels desire to look into. Whether you realize it or not, you're being observed 24-7 by the angels because they're learning the mystery in Christ through you as a member of Christ's body. So there is one God and Father of all, that is, all members of the church, the body of Christ, who is over all and through all and in you all. We see that God is working in and through us to carry out the counsel of His will, to His honor and to His glory. This is the sevenfold unity of the Spirit. But it's just not facts. It's just not doctrines. We are to make it a very part of the fiber of our being as believers in Christ and a part of the fiber of our local assemblies. And that was Paul's heart's desire for the saints at Philippi. But notice how he goes on to say, if we back up to verse 1 of chapter 4 of Ephesians, I therefore, the prisoner of our Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of your vocation or calling wherewith you are called, with all lowliness. And so as we endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit, we're to do so in all lowliness. We're to think of Christ first, others next, and ourselves last, a distant last. This term here was used by the Moravian missionaries many, many years ago. They had gone to the West Indies, and there they sought to bring the lost to Christ. And they ministered faithfully, Christ in Him crucified, for over two years with absolutely no result. And so they all came together in a meeting, and they prayed for the Lord's will. And they determined that day what they were going to do was sell themselves into slavery that they might reach their fellow man for the gospel. And within months, many of the slaves in the West Indies trusted Christ as their personal Savior because they could identify with the one who was presenting the gospel to them. That's how we maintain the unity of the Spirit in all lowliness. And in meekness, meekness is not weakness. This term in biblical times had the idea of breaking a horse that it could be ridden, but not breaking the spirit of the horse. And therefore, we see as we proclaim the riches of God's grace, we must do so from a position of strength. Our spirit is not broken by the Lord whenever we serve Him and we bring honor to His most holy name. Moses was a very meek man, but the Lord used him greatly in His service to boldly lead Israel from the midst of the Red Sea and minister the law to them. Then notice as it goes on in verse 2, with all long suffering, as we maintain the unity of the Spirit, 
and we share the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, we must be long-suffering with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember, we've been in the faith for many, many years in most cases, and we expect them to understand it after one conversation. It doesn't happen that way. Rather, it takes weeks and months. So we have to be long-suffering as we share the message of grace and forbearing one another in love. To maintain the unity of the Spirit, we have to love the unlovable as members of the body of Christ. We're not all going to agree with one another. We're not all going to be on the same page on every issue of the Scriptures. However, we need to forbear with one another for the sake of the cause of Christ. At the workplace, whenever your supervisor comes by and he gives you instructions, you may not like it, you may not want to do it, but you forbear. Why is it in the church, whenever there's a problem or a crisis, one of the first things the brethren want to do is to leave that local assembly. That's when you're needed the most. And so as we come back to Philippians chapter 1 now, and verse 27. Paul wanted there to be a oneness in this assembly. Unity is oneness. And our fellowship in the gospel is based on the sevenfold unity of the Spirit. From there, there will be differences among us, but our fellowship is always based on that. And Paul was trying to get them back to that unity of the Spirit. And that they would be of one mind, striving together for the faith of the Gospel. Now here, the term striving has the idea in the original language of an athletic context. It also is the term that we get our term athlete from. Now, I remember well when I was on the varsity track team, I ran the 440 and that had four runners. And it was a team effort. And we met with the coach. I remember early on as we were training for the 440. And we decided among ourselves how, as a team, we were going to place the runners. You always place the fastest runner in the blocks. So when that gun goes off, the fastest runner comes out, he gets the lead. Runners two and three, and that's where I fell in, our challenge was to maintain that lead or increase it. The fourth runner, the anchor, he was also extremely fast, and he would bring the baton all the way back to the finish line. And we practiced and practiced hour on hour, passing that baton seamlessly. We worked together as a team. And that year we even went to the state finals. But that's what Paul, as we bring this back to a spiritual application, desired for the saints at Philippi. That they pull together. That they work as a team together. He didn't want them, each of them, on the outs with one another. He didn't want there to be that atmosphere in that assembly that you could cut it with a knife. Rather, he desired that they come together for the sake of the gospel, as he says, as it goes on together for the faith of the gospel. And there, notice the definite article is used, the faith, I think, is speaking about the entirety now of the Pauline revelation. Then in verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, 
but to you of salvation and that of God. This is a fascinating passage. And thankfully, Paul penned these words that we have them to this hour because it teaches something we wouldn't know otherwise. Notice what the apostle says, and in nothing terrified. Or the sense there is being afraid or frightened. In biblical times, that word was used of a loud sound that caused horses to stampede. And essentially what the apostle is saying to these dear saints is this. Whenever you are persecuted, don't bolt from the faith. Rather, you need to face the opposition. You need to face the adversary. And in so doing, what you accomplish is, to them, it's a token of perdition, that is, the persecutor. But to you, it is evidence of salvation, the salvation of God, that they were saved. Now, Paul speaks about the present distress in Corinthians. And that present distress back at this time was beginning to intensify. Some of the Philippians perhaps even had suffered martyrdom. Or they were looking into the face of death. And so Paul pens these words to encourage them in the faith. I recall many years ago, Pastor Stam and I were having dinner in Chicago. And Pastor Stam began to share a little bit about the ministry of John and Betty Stam. Of course, John was Pastor Stam's older brother and his wife, Betty. They had served in China under the China Inland Mission. And they knew the dangers. And as we know, they suffered martyrdom and were beheaded at the Communist Chinese in 1934. Pastor Stam said two weeks prior to their martyrdom, John and Betty wrote a letter home to the family. And they said, it is our heart's desire that to magnify Christ, whether it be through life or through death. After their martyrdom, one month later, you would have thought that no one would want to go to China. But over 200 young men and young women applied at the China England Mission to go to the mission field, to go to China. And you know where they wanted to go? They wanted to go to the very town where John and Betty were beheaded. They weren't intimidated by the adversaries. And hundreds and thousands of others dedicated themselves in Europe and in America to the cause of Christ and missionary work. Now the day may come, brethren, that we will suffer persecution in the household of God. Not at the hands of God Almighty, he is going to one day pour out his wrath on this Christ-rejecting world, but rather at the hands of evil men. Remember and remember well this passage. To your persecutor, it shows that they are a child of perdition. To you, it shows you're a child of God. And it shows that you are saved by the grace of God. And I call your attention to the term perdition there. As we know, it was our Lord who opened the scriptures up concerning the eternal destruction of the unsaved and how they are going to go through the judgment to come at the great white throne. And they're going to be judged according to their works from our own Lord's lips. He taught about the consequences of ending up in hell. And in that day at the great white throne, all those who have spurned the love of God and rejected Christ as their personal Savior, they are going to suffer 
eternal consequences. You see, they'll still be in your, their sins. And mark these words and mark them well. They are going to stand before a holy and a righteous God and give it an account of their lives and the persecution of the saints. And they will be condemned to the lake of fire. Then in verse 29, Paul goes on to say, For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. And I call your attention to the term given there. It's of the family of words of grace. And so, essentially what Paul is saying here is, for unto you it is grace in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also suffer for His name's sake. Now, we can easily understand the first part of that. That upon belief, we are saved by the grace of God. We are given the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are saved for time and eternity. But it's also a grace to suffer for His name's sake. Now, the world would say... We wouldn't call that grace. Here we have to distinguish between the two types of suffering. We can suffer because of the sin of Adam, which has brought disease and sickness and illness upon us. I know all about it. I went through it last year. But here, Paul is speaking about a different type of suffering. <coughs> suffering for standing up for the truth of the gospel. Let's go over to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24. Colossians 1, 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. Now here we want to be very clear. Christ died for our sins. If you have placed your faith in Him, you are saved of all of your sins, past, present, and future. Paul's revelation, forgiveness, is always in the past tense. That's not the subject of this passage. Paul is saying here that we are to fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. When we look at the times and the life of Christ, we see that when He spoke the truth, they hated Him without a cause. When you speak the truth, they're going to hate you without a cause as well. He was the very righteousness of God as He ministered on earth. And as we proclaim the righteousness of God in Christ, we see we're going to be opposed as well. But Paul is saying to the Philippians, and he's saying to us as well this evening, that when we suffer for Christ, it is for the furtherance of the gospel. When Paul suffered, when he initially came into Philippi, we see that he was beaten, uncondemned, and thrown into the innermost prison. But it gave him an opportunity to witness to those prisoners and to the Philippian jailer. And as a result, they all came to know the Lord. Years later, he was taken to Rome. And the whole palace there, Caesar's palace and the Praetorium Guard, heard about Christ. They wouldn't have heard apart from the sufferings that Paul endured. I recall... Before I went into the ministry, in fact, I was training for the ministry. I was the supervisor's second shift at Mine Safety Appliance Company, and the third shift supervisor was a man by the name of Steve. He was one of these kind of guys that towered over me, a man's man. He walked around the shop chewing on a nail and used it oftentimes as a toothpick. <laughs> And as I shared Christ with him, he just thought that was a how. He could curse a sailor 
under the table. And that's saying something. And whenever he'd gather with his unsaved friends and they'd see me coming, they'd say, well, here comes the preacher. What are we going to hear about today? You're going to tell us, Paul, about hell. Oh, when we get to hell, what a celebration it's going to be. And this went on and on for well over a year. And one evening, as I was closing out my shift, Steve came up to me and he said, Paul, could you stay over for four hours? Uh, management wants me to start this mold, and it took a long time to get that particular part going, and I understood that. And he wondered if I would watch over his shift while he spent uh, his undivided attention on getting that part out of that mold. And so I agreed, and about 2.30 in the morning, Steve said, come on, Paul, uh, let's go down to the lunchroom. I'm going to buy you a cup of coffee. And as we were sitting there, he put his head down on his arm on that table, and he burst out in tears, and he cried like a baby. He said, Paul, my life is a wreck. My marriage has gone to pieces. I know I'm not right with God, and I don't know how to be right with God, but I want what you have. Amen. He left me totally speechless. Now you talk to my wife, it's pretty difficult to leave Pastor Samuel totally speechless. But that night I was in tears right along with him. And I was speechless for a moment. Before we left that cafeteria, he had trusted Christ. Amen. Amen. And we come back to the words of Sir John Bottom. In the cross of Christ thy glory, towering over the wrecks of time. What a wonderful, wonderful Savior we have. Let's close in prayer. Father, how we thank you for this time together. How we thank you for thy word and the assemblage of these precious saints in this room. Help us, Father, to base our fellowship on the sevenfold unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Help us to take this message back to our local assemblies and to our towns and our cities and share it with others that they too might be delivered from the traditions and the commandments of men. We thank you for the Savior and his love that he was lifted up once for all 